You're watching Bullhorn Reach Thought Leader Interviews with Stephen Duque. My guest today is Gordon S. Curtis, author of the book, Well Connected. Stephen, thanks so much for inviting me to join you. Uh, I've been uh, looking forward to this given that uh, when I wrote Well Connected, I was thinking a lot about my early life as a recruiter for 10 years. As, as you know, I, I'm an executive transition coach, agent, and relationship strategist. I don't know anybody out there who's got that kind of a title. What I basically do is I help senior executives to accelerate their business or career objectives, and I do the inner work of the self-assessment and, and uh, trying to figure out what they want to do when they grow up, and I'm very uh, focused and proactive in the market-facing aspect of what we do together as I am very proactive on behalf of my clients in facilitating introductions that catapult their objectives and uh, using the well-connected model to keep me honest so I don't burn out my network and or waste my time making the wrong introductions. What do you think our audience can expect to gain from employing the, the well-connected methodology and, as recruiters? Well, when I think back to, uh, and I know it's changed, and I'm dating myself, and when I think back to the days when I was on, uh, on the phone, I was in a bullpen, cubicles, and we're all on the phone, and we had to make about at least 100 calls a day. I mean, I had a cauliflower ear, just cranking <laughs> up calls, cranking up calls, and I hated it. It, it. it felt so, such a waste of time, like just a numbers game, and and. I'm always trying to figure out a better way, you know, I almost make a game out of things like that, shopping, and I'd never go sh to seven different stores to see if they have what I, like my wife would, to see if they have what I'm looking for. I'm trying to get to right to the right person. So I think what, what I've seen and have been told from people all over the world is that, that the amount of time that uh, this kind of a more deliberate analysis of one's networking activities, the, the amount of time that you can save is, you know, I put it in my coaching agreements with clients. I'm going to cut their time, networking time, in half, and I'm going to increase the equality by at least half. But generally, to go from 40 networking calls for one result to one. So if you could imagine how much wheel spin as a recruiter is potential in that business and how efficiency and effectiveness is, is the key. Um, I, I've seen people's performance skyrocket in any kind of a sales capacity in particular where everything they do wrong or right is, is going to have a direct effect of how much they make. How are social media changing the way that you and others should be approaching the well-connected methodology or thinking about it? Well, it's, it's really become the great equalizer and that recruiters can't compete on a proprietary database anymore. Everybody's got access to everybody else. And so the, the only other dimensions that I know of that you can compete on are by sheer force or volume or reach. And if you throw enough stuff up on the wall, something's going to stick. Or you can compete on relational value. And what that essentially means through the well-connected eyes is if you're going to search on LinkedIn to find someone that you want to get through to, are you able to break the second degree glass wall? meaning get through to someone that you know, sort of, who knows someone that you really want to get a hold of. How many times are you hitting up a loose connection versus investing in the right solid connections that could be the gateways to multiple highly qualified candidates, because birds of a feather fly together. Uh, so think strategic. So Well Connected is about strategic. One person to who is going to be the gateway to many high-quality people versus 
direct sales, direct recruiting, call, 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 you know? Uh, so that's how I would overlay Well Connected onto LinkedIn. In the first couple chapters, you focus most of your efforts on high-level networking and communication strategies. Um, can you tell the audience a little bit more about these strategies and whether these strategies differ when applied to the world of social media um, as opposed to the more traditional interactions? Well, it's, it's a great question, Stephen, and I've, uh, you know, trying to really encapsulate what the high-level strategies are, I think, would be assisted by my just telling you how I decided to write this thing. So I'm, uh, for the past 16 years, as this executive coach and agent, I'm, I'm sort of a hopeless connector. And I have facilitated thousands of introductions to clients. And early on in my career, the, these introductions were not always the best reflection on my judgment to make the introduction. Um, some of them were blockbuster, but some of them were bombs. And as I mentioned, I started to think really deeply about what could I do to ensure that every single introduction and on or offline networking exchange was really productive. So I started to analyze these thousands of introductions and this pattern emerged. And while I was doing this research, the, the high level strategies that really started to emerge were, were sort of dispelling of current myths like, you know, whoever dies with the most connections wins. I, I found that a real fallacy, whether it be on or offline, and particularly with social media. Some of the other strategies emerged from observations that so much of the networking value that I see people trying to exchange ends up in a pile on the table and that they don't really access the kind of value that they really could. And that there's this sort of belief that, that it's kind of like the old sales adage, you've got to make 20 calls or get 20 no's to get one yes. Or you got to network or shake hands with or exchange cards or link or tweet or, or uh, you know, connect with uh, 40 people before you can actually get anything of value. And I just never bought into that. It seems so inefficient. And so I developed this strategy from the data of the analysis, and it basically focuses on this notion of the right person and the right approach with the right person and the right approach. You can get more out of one person than you can get out of a hundred if you know what you're looking for, who's got what you need, and how to approach them in a way that makes them not just obligated to throw you a bone, but really motivated to go out of their way to drop what they're doing and help you in ways that they wouldn't for all the other people that are hitting them up for something. Throughout the book, you, you, you talk about the notion of a, a critical enabler uh, when talking about referrals. So what is a critical enabler and how do you identify one and who do you uh, recommend recruiters look to as potential critical enablers given your experience as a headhunter? I think recruiters can benefit particularly well uh, with this notion of a critical enabler. So I, I was classically trained as a recruiter and using sales um, methodologies, spin selling, and you know it's all about getting referrals to the decision maker and then just going after as many decision makers as possible. So the recruiter. You want to get around human resources and you want to get to the hiring manager who can sign off on the offer. or who, So that's the decision maker. However, all too often, we've got lists of all the decision makers. We've got them in our sites, but in all too often, people are approaching the decision maker in a way that doesn't differentiate them from all of the other recruiters that are trying to hit them up. The real best decision makers have to have a really high bar for people who they're going to spend time with. And so in order to be able to demonstrate value and 
differentiation and penetration so that they're willing to, so you're able to hurdle that bar, it takes a lot more research than most people think. Um, and so this notion of a critical enabler is someone who makes it their business to have relationships with all of these decision makers and knowledge about what their needs, challenges, objectives are so that you can surprise the decision maker with understanding about who they are and what they need while being referred by someone who they respect. So all of a sudden your new target market isn't really the decision maker, it becomes this critical enabler. So in the case of recruitment, uh, you know, everybody, we're, we're so specialized these days in search. So let's say you're specializing in, well, as I did, securities processing software development for portfolio accounting management systems. So early on in my career, I was banging away at portfolio managers and data center people and uh, basically chief information officers. And I soon came to find out that the real critical enabler, instead of going after the decision maker, were the companies that sold the software. So whether it be Thompson Financial, they had a product called uh, Porsche, and they sold into all of the large financial services institutions. The salesperson at Porsche became my new best friend. And I analyzed him and I explored this in Well Connected, tried to figure out what I could do to help this guy, whether he liked it or not, so that I would feel better about asking him for help and he would feel more motivated to help me. So I figured out what this guy's target market was, who he was selling to, and I said, we're going after the same target markets for different reasons. Tell me more about your target market criteria, the decision makers that you're trying to get into that you haven't already, companies that you want to upsell to, and let me be your eyes, an additional set of eyes and ears so I can keep an eye on it for you. And they, in this particular case, this is sort of a formative example of the critical enabler and how I've re since refined it, but they said, fantastic, no one's ever approached me trying to figure out what they can do to help me. Um, I'm always getting hit up for information. So once the, I was able to crack this guy's uh, heart, if you will, he then, he knew all of the decision makers. He also knew all the candidates that I wanted to get in front That's of. That's awesome. So I was getting referrals of searches before any other headhunters knew about them. And I was getting referred to the best candidates who were the power users of their software who they had personal relationships with. This case that you offered really is what you're describing in Chapter 6 of Well Connected, which is you know, providing value to the critical enabler. Maybe we could take a step back for the audience and just uh, you know, define generally what you mean by providing value to the critical enabler. Great question, Stephen. Value, I, I'm actually defining value or using the term progressive reciprocity. It's a term that I came up with because I saw so much obligatory reciprocal gestures out there. You know, someone calls you up and say, hey, I see that you're, or you get an email. I see that you're connected to so-and-so on LinkedIn. Can you hook me up? Yeah. Oh, let me know if I can help you. And then <laughs> afterthought, that sort of throwaway obligatory reciprocal gesture I have found is so hollow and... Uh, ungenuine that most of the value that that person could offer, they're going to sandbag and they may throw you a bone and say, have you checked out monster or, you know, or <laughs> love you a lead of someone who they don't really know who isn't really very qualified, depending on what you're looking for. And so I, I said, you know, there's gotta be a way of, and I personally don't like asking people for help. I'm kind of stoic and, and in, that ma in that way, unless I feel I can add value. So I started by building on that. And the times that I really would go over the top in, in some respects in helping other people 
uh, I was just amazed at how willing they were to help me and, and also to find out that they didn't do it for other people. So at first it was for my own edification. I wanted to come up the inventory, the needs, the business drivers of this, whoever it is that I was approaching, and then inventory my progressive, my reciprocity currencies so that I could really surprise them with value. Uh, at first, it was just for my own sake, so I'd feel better about asking for leads, referrals, or whatever. But at the same time, not only was I able more likely to ask for help, but they were much more willing to provide it. And so I really kind of made a study out of how do you determine a person's needs and how do you inventory your reciprocity currency against them so that you can help people in ways that most of the time you never thought you was possible. In your opinion, what, what about social media uh, makes them great channels for making the most of referrals? You know, it, it's a double-edged sword with social media and that there's a false sense of security that we get from just connecting to ever more people. And the more people in our social network, the, unless we have really tight criteria about what we're trying to accomplish, it's really hard to justify spending a seemingly an inordinate amount of time trying to cultivate a relationship with any one specific person when that time could be spent connecting with 20 more people and the false sense of security that we get that more is better. So I think that the, the challenge is, is, is really figuring out what it is that we're looking for. And, and in social media, it's like a library. If you walk in the library and say, I'm, I'm trying to learn something about history and that's it. You know, a small library, you might be able to stumble upon it. But if you're at the Boston Public Library, uh, it's, impossible. it's impossible. So our search criteria, we have to be much more disciplined about what it is that we're looking for, given the vastness of the resources that are available to us through social media. What does putting it all together look like? And you know, what are some potential pitfalls that our audience might want to avoid? So we look back at our networks and figure out, okay, who's got the knowledge of the relationships that we're really looking for? Um, are they inclined? Some people who we're spending a lot of time chasing down because they've got the keys to whatever it is that we're looking for, they're just not inclined. Some people get it and some people just don't. And I've wasted a ton of time with the wrong people. So, are they knowledgeable, are they inclined, and are they available? A lot of people say, yeah, I'm happy to help, and then you know, you start chasing them down, and then they commit to too many people, and they don't deliver, and that's a waste of time as well. So starting with the right people, we're looking at our networks and looking at who we're investing our relational capital with um, and determining are we focusing on the right people. Now, what I find is that most people, they have one blind spot. And all it takes is one blind spot in one's networking personal style and strategy and approach that I find can ruin the efficacy and, and the results. And, so, and everybody's got a different Achilles heel, if you will. And so you can just figure out by putting it all together and analyzing your networking to date, you can invariably find the, the one, sometimes two blind spots that you have, whether it's you're not progressively reciprocal, you're not clear about what you're asking for. You say, do you know of any good, can I just had someone approach me who lost their job and they said, well, I just lost my job and, uh, if you know of anything you think would be good for me, let me know. You know, and I'll help anybody, but I, that's like a gazillion hits, search results, unmanageable, although I won't tell them that. And, and, and this is one of the things that I try to overcome in all networking is that how many times do you, when asking for something, when you're trying to put it, put it all together and you, and you finally make the ask, do you know of any great jobs that need to be filled? Do you know of any great candidates? How many times do you get the answer? 
oh yeah, Steve, I'm, I'm happy to help you. I'll call you when I hear something. And what my argument is, is that either you're being too specific, too vague, or they don't see the value in helping you. And so they give you the proverbial, I'll call you when I hear something. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, I believe that it's not them. It's, it's you. It's either they're the wrong person or it's the wrong approach. So putting it all together is, is really just sort of analyzing each networking exchange along these dimensions that I found uh, are just crucial for networking performance. Well, thank you so much, Gordon, for your time. And the book, everyone, is well-connected. Please check it out and purchase it and rate it on Amazon.com. Thank you, Steve. Thanks again, Gordon. My pleasure. I appreciate being here with you all. And uh, you're welcome to visit www.wellconnected.me. And I hope this finds you well and connected. Thank you.